What's the most important thing for others to know about your stutter? I want people to know that what I'm saying uh, fluently it, it, it isn't more important than what I say uh, with a stutter. Hi everybody, my name is Shauna and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Welcome back to today's episode. In that introduction, you heard a short intro by Special Books by Special Kids. The video was titled Life with a Stutter and Social Anxiety. What does it mean to stutter? According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, to stutter means to speak with involuntary disruption or blocking of speech, as by repetition or prolongation of vocal sounds. For example, a stutterer might repeat syllables, for example, t-t-t-table, instead of simply saying table, or perhaps add interjections, uhs and ums, or pauses more frequently. We also use the term stammer in English to mean the same thing as stutter. She stammers. She stutters. Potato, potato. They're the same thing. Now, you clicked on this episode today probably thinking that you might learn about monsters. Let me be upfront. There are no goblins, boogie monsters, or big feet, Bigfoot, big feet, in this episode. Um, what I'll share with you today is an unethical psychology experiment on orphans called the Tudor Study. Now, it's called the Monster Study. And it was designed to discover the long-term effect of positive and negative feedback on an individual's language development. It was dubbed the Monster Study after its completion because of how cruel it was to those involved. Don't worry, nobody is going to die in this episode. However, you will learn about the individuals who created this experiment, how this experiment was conducted, and the misconduct in it, and what can be deduced based on this experiment's conclusions. 1% of the U.S. population stutters. That's about 3 million people. It's about three to four times more common in males than in females. And according to the National Institute of Health, stuttering is common among 5 to 10% of children. It's a natural part of language development. Some theories say that it's actually the brain working faster than the mouth. In any case, the majority of children grow out of stuttering. Now, that 1% of children do not. Wendell Johnson, a psychologist that we're going to learn about, was part of the 1% who did not grow out of stuttering. And he was the helper, the supervisor of the monster study. We'll begin with his story because it's essential in understanding how this study was created. Wendell Johnson was born in Roxbury, Kansas on April 16, 1906. And from a young age, like many children, he started to stutter. It was a slight stutter at first. He displayed occasional hesitation and repetition of syllables. Yet, over time, it started to get worse. Unlike other children in his class who overcame stuttering, Johnson's broken speech stayed with him throughout adulthood. This didn't affect his education much. In high school, he was the class president and valedictorian. Uh, valedictorian is a label we give to a student 
if they get the best grades in their graduating class. So Johnson was a good student, and he wasn't shut off from others either, which can be a secondary characteristic of stuttering, sort of social anxiety, separation from social situations. Those who knew him thought of him as a lighthearted guy with a good character. Some even described him as a clown. Whenever he struggled to express his thoughts, he'd look for a pen and paper, finding refuge in writing. Unlike speaking, he wrote effortlessly. At 20 years old, Johnson enrolled in an English program and then later pursued a master's in speech pathology. Speech pathology is the study of speech disorders. What in the world is a speech disorder, you may ask? It can include anything from articulation disorders, for example, pronouncing an S as a TH, behavioral disorders, such as selective mutism, being mute is when you don't speak, and that is when you become absolutely silent or mute in certain social situations. Then there's stuttering, which is an issue with fluency. It's disfluency. One who stutters can't speak fluently because of unintentional stopping. In English, we often refer to speech disorders as speech impediments. There's something that impedes your flow. It slows you down. Today in U.S. public schools, there's often a contracted or in-house speech therapist to assist students who have speech disorders. Back then, though, speech pathology was not a popular field of study. Most scientists didn't even consider it a field in science. Wendell didn't really care about the reputation of the field. He had been so affected by his own stuttering that he wanted and needed to know the causes of it and possible cures. Johnson was enrolled at the University of Iowa which was the lead institution in speech pathology at the time. Every day from dawn until dusk, students engaged in experimentation. Wendell jumped on the bandwagon. He joined the trend, in other words. So inside the lab, his classmates tried to draw some conclusions. To test the impact of fear on stuttering, They used electric shock on each other as a surprise to see how it affected their speaking patterns. They tried to scare one another by shooting guns next to another's ear while talking. They had no limitations on what they were willing to do. Like him, many other students in his class suffered from stuttering and could relate to the trials and tribulations that Wendell had. All of his classmates had similar questions. Why do some people grow out of stuttering while others don't? Where does stuttering come from? Does it have to do with the biology of a stutterer's brain? Are they wired differently? Or is stuttering a learned behavior? For example, do external factors such as pressure or criticism from teachers or parents cause it? The lead belief in the speech pathology department was that the brain of a stutterer was different. The biology caused stuttering, in other words. At one point, the department obtained an electromyograph. This hypothesis could be tested. The students could compare the brains of stutterers to those of non-stutterers. They could examine how brain activity differed. At one point, someone even pointed out that drunk people tend to stutter or have disjointed speech. They even conducted an experiment where perfect speakers, or fluent speakers, were instructed to become inebriated, to drink a lot of alcohol in order to compare. It turned out there was no relation in the brain activity of the drunk participants and the stutterers. Meanwhile, Johnson heavily disagreed with the department 
and the idea that stuttering was in our biology. He had lived a different truth. He felt his stuttering developed due to circumstances in his life. Let's flash back to his childhood. At approximately five years old, Wendell's school teacher reached out to his parents, letting them know that their son was starting to stutter. Wendell knew of this conversation, and from that moment forth, he became fixated on his words. He couldn't stop thinking about the sounds coming out of his mouth. He was so hyper-aware that instead of spitting out his thoughts, he'd trip on them. He'd fall over his words. He'd get caught up until hesitancy, repetition of sounds, all of what constitutes a stutterer became a behavior. As an adult, he strongly believed that his worrying about this supposed problem manifested into the problem itself. Anxiety about speaking incorrectly resulted in intensified disfluency. Disfluency is the opposite of fluency, a lack of fluency. As an adult, he hypothesized that parents' or teachers' criticism could cause stuttering because once you start obsessing over the abnormality, your speech becomes more abnormal. Stuttering, in his mind, was a learned behavior. He believed it could also be unlearned. This theory actually has a name. It's called the diagnosogenic theory. The question was, how could he test this? If it's a learned behavior, he would need to prove that he could develop a stutter in someone with perfect speech. Wendell was not the only one who wanted to prove this theory. One of his graduate students, Mary Tudor, was 100% on board. In 1939, Mary Tudor and Wendell Johnson organized an extensive plan that would test this theory, and it required a number of subjects, or participants. Mary's first assignment was to gather them, and she did at Iowa Soldiers and Sailors Orphans Home in Davenport, Iowa. There, there were over 600 children whose parents had either passed away or simply abandoned them. Mary Tudor was given permission to select participants from a pool of 256 orphans from around preschool age until ninth grade. Just to reiterate, An orphan is someone who has lost both parents. Mary narrowed her search down to 22. 22 orphans. 10 were orphans who had difficulty speaking, according to the in-house teachers and matrons. A matron is a woman who runs a boarding house or an institution. So they're like the head of an orphanage. And the other 12 were chosen at random. They had various levels of fluency, but no obvious signs of a speech impediment. Five speech pathologists came in to help Mary make the initial analysis of the 22 participants. They helped run a number of tests, including hearing and eyesight tests. The IQs of the children were determined. The mean average of the group was 85. And the orphans were told to read aloud for five minutes and speak for five minutes about whatever they pleased. The judges would rank their fluency from one to five, one being the worst, five being the best. These children involved had no idea what the experiment entailed. All they knew was that the study was about speech and language development. They didn't know that they were going to be lied to by Mary and her colleagues, and also by the caretakers, the teachers, and everyone in the orphanage. Behind the scenes, 
Mary was developing a method to induce stuttering in normally fluent individuals. The study started as such. Mary divided the 22 children into two main groups. The first group was made up of stutterers, and the second group, non-stutterers, or as Mary classified them, normal speakers. We'll use this term throughout the rest of the story because this is what is written in the official documentation of the Tudor study, aka the monster study. Now, within those groups, half of the students were given positive feedback on their speaking ability. Others were labeled as stutterers and given negative feedback. Let's take a closer look at how this breakdown was. Group number one, let's say 1A, had five kids, all stutterers. They were encouraged to speak and told that they had inaccurately been labeled as stutterers. They were just going through a phase, and they would speak well soon. They were given positive feedback. Group number two, or 1B, had five kids, all stutters. However, unlike group one, they were discouraged and told that they struggled with speaking. They were given negative feedback. Group three, also known as 2A, had six normal speakers. Despite their perfect language skills, they were told that they were developing a stutter and they should try to speak more fluently. Group four, or 2B, had six normal speakers who had no speech issue and were told they had no speaking difficulty. So from January to February to May of 1939, the 22 participants would meet for regular sessions with a team of speech pathologists, or the judges. What was determined? Could stutters lose their stutter if they were encouraged and told they spoke well, as in group one? According to the study, not really. Would a stutter get worse if discouraged? According to the study, not remarkably. Over the course of the semester, nothing really changed, nothing significant changed, with group one, group two, or group four. However, there was a noticeable decrease in the speaking ability by group three, the normally fluent participants who were labeled as stutters. They started to hesitate while speaking. They paused more. In the study notes, Mary wrote, quote, they spoke more slowly and with greater exactness. They had a tendency to weigh each word before they said it. Third, the length of response was shorter. Over the course of the semester, Mary had met with group three nine times, much more frequently than the other groups. At one point, the orphanage contacted Johnson to inform him that group three was not communicating at all well stressing that many had truly developed signs of stuttering. What in the world did Mary say to make group three so self-conscious of their speech? Well, listen to what Mary told the normally fluent speakers. The staff has come to the conclusion that you have a great deal of trouble with your speech. The types of interruptions which you have are very undesirable. These interruptions indicate stuttering. You have many of the symptoms of a child who is beginning to stutter. You must try to stop yourself immediately. Use your willpower. Make up your mind that you are going to speak without a single interruption. It's absolutely necessary that you do this. Do anything to keep from stuttering. Try harder to speak fluently and evenly. If you have any interruptions, stop and begin again. Take a deep breath. (sighs) Whenever you feel you are going to stutter, don't ever speak unless you can do it right. You can see how, and then she would name someone who severely stuttered in the room. You can see how 
Jeff stutters, don't you? Well, he undoubtedly started the same way you are starting. Watch your speech every minute and try to do something to improve it. Whatever you do, speak fluently and avoid any interruptions whatsoever in your speech. The following passage was taken from the original documentation of this study. How would you feel if someone said this to you? Would you become self-conscious? Can you think of a time when somebody deeply criticized the way that you spoke? How did this affect your language ability? As part of the experiment, Mary met with the teachers and matrons at the orphanage. They were told to stress the importance of speaking well. She gave some instructions on how the matrons and the teachers should speak to group three, the ones who had symptoms but were actually normal speakers. The instructions were, impress upon them the value of good speech. Remember, good speech is only speaking fluently. Watch their speech all the time and stop them when they have interruptions. Have them repeat what they said from the beginning. Don't permit them to speak unless they can say whatever it is they're saying right. They should also be aware of the way they are speaking. So they need to be given opportunities to talk so that their mistakes can be pointed out to them. Mary created this lie and asked the orphanage to reinforce it. It's not clear how much they did. However, one teacher described one member from group three during class time. She said she was, quote, restless in the class and that whenever she recited, her face became flushed. To become flushed means to turn red in the face. We might become flushed when we are embarrassed. So how did Mary track speaking progress and lack thereof? How did she measure fluency? During these meetings, the five judges sat down and independently reported on five aspects of disfluent speech. Number one, syllable repetition. Two, word repetition. Three, phrase repetitions. Four, interjections. And five, pauses. In group three, the report signaled an increase in interjections and pauses. Is that a sign of stuttering? Well, not necessarily. The key characteristic of a stutterer is syllable repetition and long block pauses. The final reports of the students from the group had notes, though, that they were having difficulty to talk, they were answering briefly, they were hesitant. However, there was no significant increase in syllable repetition. There was, however, an increase in pausing and in interjections, like uhs and ums, yikes, different sorts of sounds that we make that can indicate, you know, waiting for a thought to come to mind or for the mouth to produce what we're trying to say. Now, based on the data provided by Tudor, it's clear that labeling someone as a stutterer and pressuring them to speak correctly can negatively influence their fluency. If someone looks you in the eyes and tells you that you're wrong again and again and that you shouldn't make mistakes, you need to start over when you're making mistakes, you absolutely shouldn't speak if you're going to make mistakes, wouldn't you become more hesitant while speaking? So the ultimate question is, did these students develop a stutter? Was Mary able to induce stuttering in them? Opinions vary on this matter. Many sources say that Mary did not successfully develop stutters in children. One critic claims that of the six participants, two showed signs of stuttering at the beginning of the study, and that was disregarded. Three definitely at the end of the study, became inhibited when speaking, but they didn't necessarily stutter. And two, were developing features of stuttering, such as hesitation and regular pausing, but they did not become full-on stutters. 
otherwise there would be more syllable repetition. Mary, though, did not doubt the results. Almost all orphans in group three spoke more poorly. Their self-esteem was damaged, confidence bashed, and there was an overall increase in hesitation while speaking. What happened to the kids involved? In 2003, Mary Nixon, who was 76 years old, stood up with some other test subjects and sued the state of Iowa. Their lawyers weren't unable to get interviews from the group of subjects. However, it was reported that they felt lifelong emotional scars from this experiment. A separate report in 2001 from San Jose Mercury News claimed that three of the six with induced stutters blamed Mary Tudor for their lifetime speech handicap. In 2007, the state awarded the group $925,000 for the damages. In the 1940s and 50s, some members of the university found out about Tudor's study. They found out about it because it was never published. That's when it was dubbed the monster study because of how cruel it was. Findings of the study and how the study was conducted were kept on the DL, on the down low. Students who were at the university still respected Wendell Johnson, and they wanted to keep the incriminating information off the record. So why wasn't the monster study published after its creation? I mean, that was in 1939. The results of the study, however accurate they may be, supported Johnson's theory. Stuttering could be created in the right environment, or wrong environment. So why wasn't this study celebrated and published? Timing. It was all about timing. The timing felt inappropriate. It was 1939 to 1940, and news was spreading about Nazi experimentation at work camps. Neither Mary Tudor nor Wendell Johnson wanted to be compared with quote, concentration camp scientists. At the end of the day, there were definitely some questionable areas of conduct in the monster study. Was the study unethical? From today's standard, you'd probably say absolutely. Poor kids, they had no idea what was coming. The study was incredibly damaging to their self-esteem, their language ability, what sort of institution would let strangers in and manipulate children like that. Although this story may sound harsh by today's standards, many sources claim that the experiment wasn't unethical for the time. For one, written consent was not yet a standard procedure, so it wasn't out of the ordinary that orphans were not asked permission informed consent. Remember in episode number six of this podcast about Henrietta Lacks, uh, the same thing happened. Henrietta was the woman whose cervix cells were taken from her without her knowledge, and they're still used in labs today, HeLa cells. Furthermore, at the time when the monster study was created, it wasn't uncommon for scientists to take advantage of less fortunate individuals in the name of science. By no means does it make what Tudor and Johnson did okay. It just wasn't out of the ordinary. For example, in 1932, the Tuskegee study injected hundreds of black men in the South with syphilis to track the progression of the disease. Even when penicillin was discovered as a cure to syphilis, the men in the study weren't offered it. Many died, others went blind, some went crazy. Just the deepest form of cruelty in the name of science. Orphans are another example of how the less fortunate were used in science in the past. According to the New York Times, Wendell once claimed that, quote, I became a speech pathologist because I needed one. Johnson eventually went on to write a number of famous publications, one being The Onset of Stuttering, 
and Because I Stutter. He was also the writer of the stuttering section in the Encyclopedia of Mental Health. And the building in which he worked at Iowa University was named after him. It still is today. Mary Tudor, the graduate student who was in direct contact with the orphans, felt deep remorse for the orphans with whom she had contact. Records show that she continued to visit them after the experiment's completion, just to see how they were doing. During that time frame, she wrote to Johnson, claiming that some orphans still showed signs of hesitancy. According to modern theories, stuttering is a combo of neurological and genetic causes. And today, therapy is prescribed to those who stutter. After 20 more years of intensive research by Johnson, he expressed, quote, you can, under the proper conditions and with proper self-instructions, the appropriate language of self-communication, learn to speak without doing the things you are now doing that interfere with your speaking. In other words, there is a way to unlearn stuttering. That's the end of this episode, but I would like you to stop and think about yourself in social situations, job interviews, and high-pressure situations where you need to speak. Do you stutter? Do you trip over your words? Do you get nervous? Have you ever had the sensation that you were too rushed to speak? That people were too impatient to listen to what you have to say? Do you feel like people are not interested in what you have to say? All of this can lead to social anxiety. I'm not a speech pathologist, but I do know one thing. Don't let anyone ever make you feel like you are not worth being heard. What you say has value, and it doesn't matter how fast you speak or how perfectly you speak. What you say matters. Try to be patient with others as well. I encourage you to share your thoughts on this subject in the comments section of the Instagram post for this week. You can find that at American English Podcast. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are interested in science and experimentation, I highly suggest listening to episode number 103 about the Milgram experiment and to episode number six about Henrietta Lacks, the woman who changed science forever. Hope you're having a nice day, and until next time, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.